So I will start uh, directly with the first question. Very good. Bismillah. <coughs> Bismillah. Okay, it has already been some years since you have predicted the decline of the world's financial system that is based on fiat money. Uh, could you please elaborate uh, for our audience uh, this issue and provide also with your vision on how a Muslim nation can get out of this fraudulent system? Well, uh, Bismillah rahman rahim I am delighted. It's music in my ears to hear you describe it as a fraudulent system. Mm -hmm. Because the ulama of Islam, unfortunately, have not as yet come to that conclusion. Our ulama are in a fix because the books of fiqh which they study does not deal with the modern monetary system. They have no training, no knowledge of international monetary economics. As a consequence, they lack both the knowledge and the tools of analysis with which to be able to come to the conclusion that you have just arrived at, that the modern monetary system which emerged out of the Bretton Woods Accord of 1944 and which collapsed in August of 1971 and which was then replaced by the new and the existing petrodollar monetary system is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram, and it functions as a vehicle for the economic exploitation and financial enslavement of the masses around the world. Unless and until the ulama of Islam study international monetary economics, and uh, acquire the courage to speak out and to proclaim that which is truth and to expose that which is falsehood. It is uh, impossible for us to escape out of this financial web which has been spun around us. Uh, one last word. If our ulama were to rise up, it would be possible for us to argue that the Sharia of Islam cannot be enforced unless and until we restore dinar and dirham as money. And you cannot restore dinar and dirham as money while yet remaining a member state of the International Monetary Fund. The Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund prohibit, mysteriously so, <laughs> prohibit the use of gold as money. 
If you want to know why, you go to ask a gentleman named Dajjal. He will tell you why. <laughs> Secondly, if the ulama of Islam were to rise up, acquire the knowledge of this subject, it is possible for us, because there are so many in the world of Islam, who even when they are secularized, even when they acquire part of the modern way of life, still have love in their heart for Islam. True. Still have love in their heart for moral values, for what is right and what is wrong, for what is just and what is unjust. They have it in their hearts. And so it will be possible for us to argue that if someone were to offer to pay an amount which is due in a business transaction, mm -hmm. to pay an amount which is due in dinar and dirham. I owe you so much money because I bought goods from you. And I offer to pay you in dirhams. If you were to refuse to accept the dirhams and were to demand instead US dollars or Pakistani rupees or Indonesian rupee, then you would have committed a sin and you will have to answer for that sin on Judgment Day. Here is a strategy which our ulama can use effectively, effectively, to not only get people to start buying dinar and dirhams, we don't need dinar as much as we need dirham. And when you start buying dinar and dirham, and then using it for buying and selling. Our trade union movements will then get some knowledge in their head. And the trade union movements will then say, well, we want to be paid our wages in real money, not in crooked money. <laughs> you see, the trade union movement like the ulama of Islam, do not have the knowledge of international monetary economics. And so they go into negotiations to demand wage increase. <laughs> exactly. And when they win a wage increase, inflation wipes it out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they will wake up the reality and demand that wages be paid in dinar and dirham. Yeah. So you, so basically, it's uh, it can only be some individual initiatives. Uh, it cannot be an organized action in order to get out of this system. You don't you don't view you don't view it like that. I do not see any other group mm -hmm. capable of mobilizing the masses okay. unless that group has Islam as its basis for mobilization. Yeah. Ikhwan al-Muslimun in Egypt were assisted by many decades of oppression, brutal oppression, mm -hmm. under Jamal Abdel Nasser. He brutally oppressed them. And then you had Husni Mubarak continue brutal oppression. And so they won the sympathy of the Egyptian masses. Ikhwan has a modernist version of Islam, <laughs> which apparently 
who Washington finds comfortable today. So if Ikhwan succeeded in Egypt, mobilizing the masses of Egypt who have love for Islam, but because Ikhwan lacks the ulama, the, the authentic intellectual leadership is Islam. Ikhwan is taking Egypt on a ride, and Washington is taking Ikhwan on a ride. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so let's say they succeed in Egypt. If they have the ulama, of course, and uh, if they get uh, the, the wise people and the heart to do it, uh, do you think the Zionists would, uh, would let this kind of system emerge in the Islamic world? We need, we need Muslims with backbones made of iron and steel. I believe Algeria has backbones made of iron and steel. Yes, <laughs> I believe mean, the Algerian intellectual, the Algerian scholar, has that courage, that backbone, which if he is taught the subject correctly, mm -hmm. he would stand up more authentically than Egypt is standing today. So there is hope in Algeria. I am surprised. I am not Arab. I have never visited Algeria. <laughs> and I'm getting more emails from Algeria today. <laughs> I'm getting them in French. I'm getting them in English. And I'm getting them in Arabic. <laughs> And more emails from Algeria today than from any other Arab country. Wow, that's you great. Don't that's know. great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people follow you here. And I'm getting emails from both brothers and sisters. The women, some of them young women, are just as interested in making contact with me and discussing the problems as a men are. Yeah. Which is a good sign. Yeah. Right, right. So, Sheikh Imran, uh, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, we, I don't know if you heard about it. I mean, it, maybe it was a rumor, maybe it was true. It's about Muammar Gaddafi's project uh, to reinstitute the gold dinar in Libya. Uh, if that was a real case, do you think that was the reason for, uh, for having him uh, for the for his execution, or there is something else in your point of view? Well, first of all, prior to the armed uprising in Libya, mm -hmm. we were never told about these plans for the gold in our. Okay. Okay. We did not know, we did not know mm -hmm. that Libya had a substantial amount of gold reserves in Libya itself, which is a good sign. Mm -hmm. When the IMF prohibited the use of gold as money, the Articles of Agreement also required every member state to deposit with the IMF, which is the Federal Reserve, 25% mm -hmm of all your gold holdings. This was international law. <laughs> and when you deposited that 25%, then the Zionists knew how much gold you had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then the IMF rules prohibited you from buying or selling gold without disclosing it to the IMF. Where were the ulama of Islam? Drinking coffee? 
what would you do with your gold that you have when you cannot use it as money? It's just lying there. The IMF then said, you can get IMF loans from us using your gold as collateral. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll get the IMF loans at concessionary rates. Number one, where did IMF get money from? The United States is the biggest contributor to the IMF. And as a result, the United States has a controlling interest in the IMF. The US dollar <laughs> is a petrol dollar. Mm. It has no link with gold. Nope. All that you need is a printing press and paper and ink. Ink. That's yeah. all. <laughs> printing press, a paper and ink. France cannot do it. Germany cannot do it. Britain cannot do it. Only Uncle Sam. Only Uncle Sam. So they make money out of thin air. They create wealth out of thin air. And then they want to lend that to you on interest. <laughs> and you can borrow from them using your gold as collateral. So the trap was set yeah. that countries will send more and more of their gold. So the 25% will become 40 and 50 and 70%. So they can use that gold as collateral. Thinking that the gold is safe. And when you want it back, you can get it back. You just have to pay the loan. Today, Germany is under pressure to bring back its gold to Germany. The Federal Reserve and the IMF refuses hmm. to send it back. It's for repatriation. The German government then demanded an audit of its gold just to confirm that it's that is still there. Okay. The IMF refused. <laughs> Refused. Okay? So, Ghazafi has to be credited if he did the sensible thing of bringing back as much of his gold as he could to Libya. Hugo Chavez is doing that in exactly. Venezuela. Exactly. This is a sensible thing. But to use gold as money, to bring dinar and dirham as a monetary system, we never heard a word of that. Not at all. Okay. Until after he was overthrown. Okay. What was the reason for the overthrow of Gaddafi? There are many different reasons. They planned the Arab Spring. I agree. <laughs> okay, in advance. This is not the first Arab Spring. The first Arab Spring took place a hundred years ago. And it brought the Saudis into power. <laughs> okay? It removed the Ottomans. This is the second Arab Spring. And uh, they were sending weapons to Benghazi in preparation, long years in advance. Who it is who is functioning as the conduit for weapons to reach Benghazi? Answer, it had to be spirited from Egypt. Exactly. From Egypt. Who it is in Egypt who helped and facilitated NATO to bring those weapons into Benghazi? I think Iqwan has some answers to give us. I don't want to say anything more. <laughs> Okay. have to say anything more. There's something called a quid pro quo. Why did they want Libya? Answer. Among the different reasons is one which is located in Ilmu Akhirul Zaman or Islamic 
eschatology. Hmm? Eschatology is a branch of knowledge. In the English-speaking world, in the French-speaking world, eschatology. Mm -hmm. But eschatology is not recognized as a branch of knowledge in the Arabic-speaking world. We do not have courses of study on Ilmu Akhir Zaman. <laughs> no. This is just, by the way, to our short studies in Fiqh, and in Sharia, and in Tafsir. Kitab al Fitr is just another chapter, not a branch of knowledge. But I have devoted attention to Ilm al Akhir al Zaman. And as a consequence, I came to the conclusion that the central figure of Ilm al Akhir al Zaman is Al Masih al Dajjal. Yeah. Al Masih al Dajjal cannot claim to be Al-Masih. The Jews will not accept him as Al-Masih unless and until Israel replaces the United States as the ruling state in the world. And secondly, that the territorial frontiers of Israel must expand to encompass the biblical frontiers the biblical frontiers are from the river of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Why did they put that in the Bible? It was written with their own hands. It's false. <laughs> That's not al abdul muqaddasa Not at all. But they put it in the Torah. Because Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam was taken to Egypt. Commission. And then Nabi Yaqub alayhi salam and Banu Israel went to Egypt. And they lived in the eastern delta. At that time, only the eastern delta was known as Misr. Today, the whole of Egypt is known as Misr. But when the Quran refers to Misr, it is not referring to the whole of Egypt. Eastern delta. It, referring to only the eastern delta between the river Nile and the Red Sea. Because Banu Israel lived there for hundreds of years, because the Anbiya alayhi salam lived there, Yusuf alayhi salam, Yaqub alayhi salam, uh, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, Harun alayhi salam, they came to the conclusion that this is a part of Al Abdul Muqaddas. And because Banu Israel were taken to Babylon, and they lived in Babylon for centuries, and Anbiya alayhi salam went to Babylon, where they lived with them in Babylon, they came to the conclusion that that was also a part of Al Abdul Muqaddas. And so, Israel, when we study the subject from eschatology, Israel has to expand its territorial frontier to encompass the eastern delta of Egypt and Sinai. The only way Egypt, Israel can do that is by launching a ground invasion. Mm -hmm. The ground invasion from the east would succeed if you also have a ground invasion from the west. So long decades ago, they had their eyes on Libya. Decades ago, that they have to take control of Libya, NATO. And the Salafi, Salafi Islam, has this unique characteristic. I'm sorry that my language is so harsh, but they deserve it now. Salafi Islam has this unique characteristic that they have eyes and they cannot see. And so they were taken for a ride. And today NATO is in Libya. So when the attack on Egypt takes place, NATO will attack from the west, 
and Israel attack from the east. Southern Sudan is now an ally of Israel. Exactly. So you have an attack from the south, and from the north you have a naval blockade. Mm -hmm. And now you have Egypt with Ikhwan playing into the hands of the Zionists. Instead of uniting Egypt, Ikhwan is dividing Egypt. So the reason for the overthrow of Gaddafi, the primary reason, long-term reason, is to give NATO a foothold in Libya so that Egypt can be attacked from the west. Can f I fully agree with you, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Hussein. I, uh, I, I, I completely understand. Uh, my next question is about the Arab Spring. I mean, since the Arab Spring, uh, I mean, here in Algeria, we are faced with the three unrest areas, which is Tunisia, uh, Libya, but we have a big frontier with Libya, and also Mali. Uh, Mali is uh, is a country that is uh, that is facing some major uh, major issues. I mean, it can also risk to be fully split. Um, do you think it's a pure coincidence, or there is uh, or or uh, or there is uh, uh, there is uh, probably a, a plan to to destabilize Algeria also? Okay, there's another reason why Libya was attacked. Mm -hmm. and that's oil. They wanted the Libyan oil. Yes. They wanted to control Libyan oil. And they now have that control. Like they control the Saudi oil. <laughs> <laughs> Algeria, amongst all the North African countries, has, I believe, very large reserves of gas. Yes. And Algeria is now a major exporter of natural gas. Algeria natu natural gas is going to Europe. Yes. To France. As a consequence of your gas reserves, and also as a consequence of the fact that there is some measure of stability in the society in Algeria. Some measure of stability. Mm -hmm. It is very easy to ex understand that they will not allow Algeria to remain as it is. No. They will devise a strategy to bring internal unrest, to bring chaos to Algeria. They will devise a strategy for regime change so that they can take control of the gas reserves. If the gas reserves are now under the control of Algerian nationalists, who put Algeria first. Tomorrow is going to be differently, like Libya. Hmm? Then there is also the second problem that Algeria is a vast country, a huge country. And that requires them to devise a strategy for the breakup of large Muslim countries into small statelets. Don't be surprised when Egypt becomes three or four different countries. Don't be surprised when Pakistan becomes three or four different countries. And these small states can easily be controlled by the hegemonic power. In Pakistan, of course, the hegemonic power is India. In Egypt, it will be Israel. Saudi Arabia and Qatar, of course, as allies of Israel. Exactly. Yeah. I do not know enough about Algeria and about Morocco and Tunisia to be able to fathom their thinking. But what is happening in Mali 
appears to me to be sufficiently important to deserve careful study. Hmm. And uh, I lack the tools here in Malaysia to be able to make that study of what is happening hmm. in Mali. Hmm. But I'm sure that your scholars in Algeria, when they know that the plan is to break up Algeria, and to take control of the gas reserves. They will be able to understand what is happening in Mali from a different perspective, yeah. Well, um, uh, the population here in Algeria, they are aware uh, because of what we lived uh, in the 90s. I mean, in the 90s, Algeria was a target uh, from Salafis and also, also some, uh, some, I mean, Islamic fanatics uh, that created some major problems here in Algeria and uh, do, do you think that this uh, the, the destabilization that Algeria lived in the 90s was a part of a lab for the future Arab Spring in terms of uh, destabilization method because oh, what was... happened in Algeria in the 90s mm -hmm was repeated in Egypt <laughs> last year. Okay. When a people have suffered sufficiently, in the case of Algeria, it was brutal French colonial rule. Mm -hmm. And the Algerians are a proud people. And they resisted French colonial rule. Hmm? And when uh, they suffered as much as they did under French colonial rule, then there was a, uh, a longing in their hearts to return to their original roots. Ahmad bin Bella uh, emerged in the 1960s as a very popular leader. Um, I was a young man at that time, and uh, Ahmad Ben Bella uh, took North Africa by storm as a popular leader. Um, and then came the time of Hawari Bumadien. Um, but the leadership was similar to Jamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. It did, not, it did not reach the core of the people, their hearts. No. Uh, in order to reach their hearts, you have got to touch the world of the sacred. You can't do that with a secular, ide secular ideology. Okay? Uh, North Africa is essentially spiritual. A Salafi version of Islam will not win their hearts. No. No. <laughs> no. They're very spiritual. This is part of Africa. I think Algeria and Morocco didn't get it from the Arab world, they got it from Africa. Exactly. <laughs> the African has its roots in spirituality. The Indian and the Persian from Iran. They have the intellectual power. And you had great scholars coming from India and from Iran. But Africa had this beautiful roots of spirituality. And that was retained in North Africa as Islam. So Ahmad Ben Bella, Hawari Ben Bumadian, they could not succeed in penetrating the internal, the hearts of the people to satisfy them. Because you have to do that by touching the world of the sacred. The Salafi could not do it. No. You need an articulation of Islam, which is intensely spiritual which is dynamic, 
which is courageous in opposing injustice in the world and oppression in the world. Hmm? Yes. And when you have that in Algeria, you'll be able, you'll be able to offer a leadership role in Arab affairs. Many, many people have been asking me, I constantly get these questions, what is the place of Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia in, in Akhir al-Zaman? <laughs> you will be surprised the number of emails I get. I wish that your, your journal will give this answer to them. That Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, that is Libya before this revolution, this uprising. You have a role waiting for you to articulate an Islam that is intensely spiritual, that touches the innermost feelings of the people, brings out that which is most noble in them which is attractive. The Islam of Ikhwan and Muslim moon is not attractive. <laughs> it's not attractive. You have to enforce the Sharia not with a baton. <laughs> you have to enforce the Sharia in such a way that you're able to demonstrate its superiority over every rival. So that people would be attracted to the Sharia. Rather, you're having to take a baton to bring them and Sharia over them. That is the role waiting for Algeria. Inshallah. That is the role waiting for Algeria because you've got the courage in Algeria. You've got the backbone in Algeria. You've got the history in Algeria. Okay? And all that you need now is the scholars, the scholars who will be able to present that version of Islam which cannot tolerate injustice and oppression. Not at all. Never. And which, which is, we see with two eyes. <laughs> Dajjal sees with one. This is not eschatology. This is epistemology. To see with two eyes. Dajjal sees with one. He's blind in the second eye. Meaning is internally, internally blind. Internally blind. Mm -hmm. That is Ikhwan today. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> so if you can, if you can develop that scholarship in Algeria, which combines external knowledge with internal knowledge, then you'll produce people who will walk in the path of Khidr alayhi <laughs> salam. That is the role that's waiting for you in Algeria. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. And we count a lot on uh, on you. Uh, I hope you will honor us uh, in a visit to Algeria that you would like to organize, uh, to maybe to get you know that uh, something you know starting from the from the scholars. <laughs> Once they, I would, they they see. I'm delighted to visit Algeria yeah. and Morocco. Um, the problem I face is that the only language that I use is for lecture and teaching mm -hmm. is English. Je peux parler français un peu tout petit peu. Comprendre. Mais c'est difficile faire une conférence en français. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I, I cannot... I cannot express myself at the level of exactitude that I want in Arabic or in French. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make mistakes. Oh, no. If I were to come to Algeria or to Morocco or to Egypt or to Tunisia or to Mauritania and I were to speak in English, you would have to be translating to Arabic and to French all the time. We can organize that. We can organize that. <laughs> Sheikh Imran, I have also um, another question. Uh, from an eschatological point of view, 
uh, would the conflict in Syria lead to a major war between the East and the West? Yes, without doubt. I am of the opinion. In fact, this morning, I met for about two hours mm -hmm. with a, a sheikh from Syria, in Brunei, <laughs> and another Syrian scholar, two of them, for about two hours this morning. If the situation in Syria continues as it is, Bashar Assad is not going to last. Yes. If he collapses, if his regime collapses, then Syria will become another Libya. Meaning that NATO will gain a foothold in Syria. That will result in two implications. Number one, Goodbye to Russia. The Russian naval base will be closed down mm -hmm. and will become a NATO naval base. And Israel will be smiling. <laughs> Number two, the Syrian support for Iran will be finished. And Iran will be isolated. So all that Israel has to do is to wait. Time is on Israel's side. However, if they decide that they waited long enough, then there is a possibility that Turkey would invade Syria using some pretext. In order for Turkey to invade Syria, you need to have a deal, an understanding between Washington and Moscow. The Zionists can say to Putin, if you stay out, we will stay out. But if you enter the war, we'll enter, and then it's going to be a nuclear war. So if you see Turkey attacking Syria, and Moscow does not intervene, the implication is that there's an understanding between Washington and Moscow. If there is no understanding between Washington and Moscow, Moscow will intervene. And once Russia intervenes, you've got the beginning of what will eventually become what the Prophet ﷺ called the Malhamah. The Malhamah will have to be the war of all wars between the two superpowers, the American-led alliance and the Russian-led alliance. Gog and Magog is a very important subject for understanding the Malkama. But Gog and Magog, or Yajuj and Majuj, is not taught. <laughs> we don't have just teaching the subject. I mean, uh, before before I discovered your teaching, Sheikh Imran, I always thought that Gog and Magog were small people with big ears and... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is very important, very important for us to understand eschatology here. Our Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, that we will make an alliance with Rome. Rome in the Quran is Byzantium. When Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered Constantinople, then Rome shifted to Russia. To Russia. But prior to Rome being Constantinople, Rome was in Italy. And Rome was a pagan city hmm. worshipping idols. So when the Quran uses the word room, we know we're talking about Eastern Christianity, Byzantium. Hmm. And the Coptic Christians of Egypt belong to Rome. Hmm. 
<laughs> and you'll make an alliance with Rome. But when the word Rome occurs in the Hadith, there is the distinct possibility that Rome in the Hadith could refer to either the Western Alliance, because it's pagan, <laughs> it's still pagan today, the Catholic Church, or the Eastern Christians, which is now Muslim. So we've got to be very careful in studying the Ahadith on Rome. Gog and Magog are responsible for empowering the Western Alliance, and Gog and Magog attacked Russia in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution mm -hmm. and took a Russia which was Rome which was intensely Christian and transformed it into an atheist state, yes. the Soviet Union. And when it became the Soviet Union, then it became a superpower. Prior to that, Russia was never a superpower. No. Russia was just one more of the European powers. But once the Bolshevik Revolution took place in 1917, and Russia became a, an atheist state, Soviet Union, then came nuclear power, then came satellites, <laughs> and uh, air, air power. Hmm. But look what happened when the Berlin Wall fell. Russia is now returning to Christianity. Yes. Whether it's Vladimir Putin or anybody else, it doesn't make a difference. This is what is happening in Russia today. So, a Russia which was Gog and Magog is now returning to Rome. And we Muslims are going to make an alliance with Rome. So, watch Turkey. If Turkey attacks Syria and Russia responds with an attack on Turkey, you have the beginnings now of what the Prophet ﷺ described as Malham. Islamic scholarship needs to devote attention to eschatology to be able to understand and to guide on this issue. Remember that in the hadith of uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, there is this hadith. Uh, Umran Bayt al Maqdis, Kharabu Yathrib. Kharabu Yathrib, Fathul Khuruj al Malhama. Khuruj al Malhama, Fathul Constantinia. Fathul Constantinia, Khuruj al Dajjal. This is the timeline. This is the timeline. So after the Malhama, there is the Fathul Constantinia. Mustafa Kamal did not want us to remember that. No. So they changed the name from Constantinople to Istanbul. And they made it illegal. It is illegal in Turkey to use the word Constantinople. You'll be arrested. Yeah. Because they wanted the Turkish people to be brainwashed into believing that the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad has already been fulfilled 600 years ago. That's false. The Fatul Constantinia is to come. It will come after the Malhama. And when it does come, after the Malhama there will be no East, air power. No. All fighting will be on land and on the sea. So the Fatul Constantinia after the Malhama is to actually allow the Soviet Union, sorry, Russia, Russia. Russia's Navy that survives the Malhama to be able to get into the Mediterranean. The Fatul Constantinia is going to break the backbone of NATO. So watch carefully events in Syria and Turkey because there lies the key 
to great wars which are coming in the future. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, you uh, in your uh, in your lectures you focus on uh, predictions contained in the Quran and uh, in many aspects of uh, this life on Earth. Uh, could you give us some more examples? I have used the methodology mm -hmm. which was taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning of the Quran when he said and remember that Allah is not deficient in the use of language no <laughs> so when he said fasajadu illa iblis Three words. <laughs> it is deliberately constructed like this, the sentence. If we take this ayah by itself in isolation, if we use this lazy methodology, we cannot escape the conclusion that Iblis was an angel. Yes. <laughs> cannot escape. Iblis was an angel. So this sentence is constructed like that to teach you a lesson in, in uh, Usul al-Tafsir. It is when you go to the totality of the Quran, then you realize, but angels don't have any free will. Angels can't say no when they order. So if you give Something, you say something to your wife and she says, no, then she's not an angel. <laughs> <laughs> Angels cannot say, وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ says Allah. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ So, if Allah gave a command to the angels and one did not obey, he could not be an angel. Yes. And when we go to Surah al then we are told, what can I mean al -jin? So in this, in this very simple verse of the Quran, a profound message, a profound lesson in methodology is given. And that is that you must take the Quran as a whole. Take all the data that you have on a particular subject and bind it together to form a harmonious whole. The Quran is consistent with itself. There is no inconsistency. So this methodology of taking the totality of the data from the Quran and then supported by the Hadith. Using this methodology, I was able to penetrate by Allah's kindness the ayah of Surah to Yusuf, sorry, Surah to Yunus. Fir'aun is drowning. And while he's underneath the water drowning, the veils are removed from his eyes and he now recognizes he is not God. Previous to this, <laughs> So now he declares that I have faith in the God of Banu Israel underneath the water. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and he says, al -an, وَقَدْ عَصَيْتَ قَبْلُ وَقُلْتَ مِنَ الْمُفْسِدِينَ فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً لِتَكُونَ دعني his badan his badan لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ his body was preserved. 
And his body was rediscovered in 1897, I believe. What is the ayah? What is the ayah? And who are those? Liman Khalfaka. Who are they? Answer that in the same way that that confrontation between truth and falsehood, between Fir'aun and Musa al-Islam, with this side powerful, armed to the teeth, arrogant, and this side with no weapons, no, small in number, but with the truth. This confrontation climax with a divine intervention. And that divine intervention led to victory for truth. The ayah is that in Akhirul Zaman, the body of Fir'aun will be discovered. And this epic encounter, Liman Khalfaka ayah, the ayah is that this epic encounter will be repeated in Akhir Zaman. That's what we're witnessing now. And there will be a divine intervention in this one, as there was in that one. This divine intervention is the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Who were the people? Liman Khalfaka. Answer? The Zionists. That in the same way that Fir'aun died <laughs> and he had to declare his faith in the truth before he died. But it was no help for him. Similarly, the, the Zionists will have to accept Islam when Nabi Isa Islam returns. I told him that in New York. <laughs> I, I went into a Jewish synagogue and I lectured before 200 Jews and I told them this. They surrounded me after the lecture, demanding why should we be forced to accept that which we have rejected. My answer was on that day the veils will be removed from off your eyes. Hmm? So this verse of the Quran is of pivotal importance for understanding politics, for understanding the economy, for understanding the monetary system. Al-an wa qad asayta qabl wa kunta min al-mufsirin falyawma nunajjika bi badani litakuna liman khalfaka aya the body of Fir'an was discovered in 1897. The First World War took place in 1914. In 1907, <laughs> Britain and France put the checks, the chessboard in place. They put all the pieces in place in 1907 when Britain and France made an alliance with Russia. <laughs> so, from 19, from the time the body of Fir'aun was discovered, everything is falling in place. We are now in the countdown. This is the countdown of Akhil Zaman. But Islamic scholarship is asleep. Yeah. I've given you one example of an eye of the Quran. Mm -hmm. If I had the time, I will go to Surah Al-Ma'idah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا لَا تَتَّخِذُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَةً Not all Jews. No. Not all Christians. No. Not possible. Not possible. Why? وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ النَّصَارَ So it could not be all Christians. Well, then which Christians and which Jews? Which Christians and which Jews? The answer is right there. 
and the words which follow. The Quran is saying that there's going to be an alliance between Christians and Jews when that alliance takes place. And you see reconciliation between Christians and Jews. It is with that alliance that you are prohibited from maintaining friendship and alliance. That alliance has today come into being. It's the Christian Zionist and, Christian and Jewish Zionist alliance, which is Saudi Arabia is so comfortable and Qatar is so comfortable. Every government in the world has to bow down before them. Every government, otherwise they'll destroy your economy. But Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ If you turn to them with friendship and alliance, and I don't expect that from Algeria, if you turn to them with friendship and alliance, you belong to them, not to us. That's what they did in Libya, when they made a deal with NATO. So I say to them, I don't want to see your faces. I don't even want to hear your voices. You are not my brothers. You belong to them now. You know they belong to us, unless you make Tawbah. So here is a second verse of the Quran. Hmm. There are several more. I'll give you one more and we'll stop. Okay. <laughs> Surah Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya. Two ayat. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرِيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ يعني أهل القرية حتى إذا فتحت يأجوج ومأجوج وهم من كل حدب ينسلون which قرية Jerusalem yeah. today it's easy for you to say Jerusalem <laughs> because the events have unfolded so many events have already unfolded that we can easily recognize that the Korea is Jerusalem. And those who bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, they are Yajuj and Majuj. The Jews are back in the Holy Land today. The state of Israel has been restored in the Holy Land. That Israel is today poised to take over from the United States as the next ruling state of the world. In the same way that Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica, the plan is for Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana. I explained this in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. But scholars of Islam are not using this verse of the Quran. They, they refuse to accept that the Korea is Jerusalem. There are several other verses of the Quran which are located in Ilmu Akhil Zaman, which help us to understand the world today. Hmm. Thank you very much, Sheikh Imran. In your opinion, why why the scholars of Islam are not uh, are not trying to 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 make an effort in order to to explain things? I mean, mainly on the on the riba. On, the, on this geostrategical uh, issues, why are they acting like that? I mean, I don't understand that. Number one, because the institutions of Islamic learning have become Fossilized. <laughs> <laughs> One Sunday morning, Al Azhar University woke up and rubbed his thighs and looked down the road and saw Cairo University. <laughs> so Al Azhar asked, What's that? Where did that come from? The establishment of Cairo University was the beginning of the challenge 
of secular scholarship challenging Islamic scholarship. Al-Azhar could not respond. From the time Cairo University was established until the fall of King Farouk and the revolution in Egypt when Jamal Abdel Nasser took over Al-Azhar controlling it. Al-Azhar could not respond because the curriculum of studies could not be modified if the student the capacity to understand the world which has come from modern Western civilization. The reason why I have been blessed by Allah with a little bit of knowledge to understand is because my teacher of blessed memory, Mawlana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, he understood this deficiency in Islamic education and he established an institute of Islamic studies in Pakistan where I study. As a student of Islam, I had to study the philosophy of history. I had an eminent scholar teaching me the philosophy of history. I had an eminent scientist teaching me the philosophy of science. <laughs> hmm? But more importantly than this exposure to Western knowledge was the methodology that he gave to me for using the Quran and the Hadith to assess what was valid and what was invalid in the knowledge which was coming to me. After I graduated at the Institute, I then went back home to Trinidad and Tobago and I applied for a job in the foreign ministry when I was interviewed. And they said, we would like to have you in the foreign ministry, but we want to send you back to university. So they gave me a scholarship to do postgraduate studies in international relations. The class is small. It's the la, the, as they say in French, la creme de la creme. <laughs> <laughs> and they are graduates from French universities, Sorbonne. A graduate from the London School of Economics. Graduate from American universities, Canadian universities. And I am the only one with a Pakistani degree. <laughs> all looking down on me. It's a one year course. Intense studies for one year. Mm -hmm. It's the first time that I'm studying international politics. Never studied it before. First time that I'm studying international economics. Never studied it before. And in my class, in my class, there's someone with a master's degree from the London School of Economics. At the end of the year, at the end of the year, I came first in the exams. And I, I beat in the economics examination, international economics, I beat the fellow with the master's degree from the London School of Economics. How do we explain it? How do we explain that someone with a master's degree from Karachi University, having never studied, and many of these are diplomats in the class, could beat them all and come first? The answer is that I had an advantage over them. I had the Quran. They did not. And I had Nabi Muhammad, and they did not. Because my teacher had trained me to be able to use the Quran and use the Hadith with a particular methodology to study the world today. We don't have that in our institutions of Islamic learning. The second reason why Islamic scholarship is failing 
It's because the best brains that we have, <laughs> the best brains that we have, they go to the United States, <laughs> <laughs> they go to Germany, and they go to France. The best. They go to M MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. They go to the Sorbonne. And those who cannot get in into the best universities abroad, they'll go to the best universities in Algeria. And those who cannot get in anywhere else, then they come to study Islam. This is the third rate. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, there's the fact that Islamic scholarships doesn't give you money. You might get a job as an imam in a masjid. That's all. And you get a small salary. And you have to maintain your wife and children. So you cannot jeopardize your job. No. So you have to dance to the tune which is playing because of poverty. Where will you get that uh, integrity of scholarship? That I'll stand up and proclaim the truth regard of, con regard of consequences, without respect, regard for consequences. I am able to do that because I earn my livelihood from the sale of my books. Alhamdulillah, life sufficient for me and my wife to survive. So no one can play a tune for me and ask me to dance to it. No. If we can give our scholars of Islam that independence of livelihood, independence of livelihood, then they can muster the courage and integrity to stand up and proclaim the truth. I've given you three reasons there why we have this failure. Thank you very much, Sheikh Imran. It was, uh, it was uh, full of uh, teachings. Alhamdulillah that we've been able to do it today, and I look yes. forward, inshallah, to the next time. Okay.